thank you so much for all the time that it took um, to put this together. And I think social studies is such a fascinating subject, and um, I certainly learned a lot about how you um, how you integrate it from kindergarten, which I've never thought about. You know, teaching kids about community and, and that sort of structure, all the way um, to twelfth grade. Um, I'm very excited to see um, the collaboration that you're looking at. I think that's going to be a tremendous asset to the district, and thank you for taking that extra step to do that. I'm wondering, what do you feel the ideal numbers are for a social studies teacher? And it's just, you know, I saw that a couple of different times. And what do you feel? I mean, I, I think it makes a lot of sense because you're doing quite a bit of grading, and if you had more time to... Um, to collaborate with your students, it, I, I could see how it would help um, literacy quite a bit. What? Just a number, any number I would be an ideal. I, I know. <laughs> Four. <laughs> Four. Um, I, I'm not. <laughs> and what are your load? What are your class loads now? I, I mean, I think it's in here. But what would you like to see? Um, I, um, I can't speak for my colleagues. I think my class load is like 96 right now. You have about 96 um, students. I, um, I I would humbly, you know, maybe first look to a Ted Pfizer who said 80 was good for high school teachers. Um, I, it's very difficult to answer the question because it always depends on the course and the students that you're teaching. Um, it depends on the degree of differentiation that's being required mm -hmm. in a room. Um, it, depending on the course, I, I know for many of us at all levels, we've talked about integrating global things. I mean, sometimes, you know, it's I got to spend two hours researching because we're teaching current stuff, and um, on top of the grading, that 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 piece it becomes difficult. Um, and and so, you know, I I. I think that I, every um, every teacher can make argue, really good arguments why in their field or their discipline their numbers ought to be very low. But I think we are we are beginning to see a paradigm shift in education, which is summed up by the idea that wow, we authentically are not going to leave children behind them, right? And and if we're not going to do that, then that means there's more time and care and concern that needs to go into getting to know the students, getting to know their needs, and sometimes throwing up a plan and starting new and adapting as you go. And I think I, I personally don't even know exactly what those challenges are going to entail in the future. But I think that, that there's a direct correlation between those new challenges that, are, that we are facing as teachers and our student loads. How's that for non-answer? Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, when, well, when you talk, you should go into politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you're talking about some of the things that Gretchen was talking about that they do and that we start to do in the middle school, which is moving beyond, um, you know, basic writing skills and, right. and, and trying to get the students to um, formulate opinions and stances and, and to take the information and turn that, you know, that, that standard essay into a, into a persuasive um, essay that you know that in itself cannot be done by looking at the web, the teacher website and getting the assignment. I mean, that, and that also can't be done in a, a teacher-led uh, lesson. I mean, it can start. It can be done a little bit, but what that really to get that student to understand and to and to, to sort of coach them through the thinking process. That's just the thinking process. Let alone the research and the and the writing process. That takes one-on-one -on -one conferencing with that student to, to to probe and to question and to you know have you thought about this and have you have you looked at this and um, so those are the types of things that we so very much want to do with our kids because you know there's a lot of kids I don't care what level they are kids can kids can think about things in their own way and and, and they're and they're really intrinsically motivated when they're able to take a stance and. And, and, and defend it, or to, to, or to, you know, take a topic and really explore it um, that they're interested in. And so, if we have those kids that, and, and we have these students, you know, primed and ready to do that, um, we do them a disservice to just sort of give this this blanket lesson 
in a, in, a, in a given class and say, go home and write it, you know. And so these are the types of things that we, we want to do, um, and it's difficult. It's difficult when you have 22, 21. I mean, I haven't had less than 20 in a class, and I don't know how long. So. It's the same with yeah. the little ones. You know, we, um, we're also doing one-on-one -on -one conferencing in our literature, in our literacy block. We're doing one-on-one -on -one conferencing in our writing block. We're doing research in our science and social studies that also require one-on-one -on -one conferencing. So in, in the same line, it, we want to hit every child's, every child's need. And it's, the bigger the class, the less we can do that. We just, there, there's so much that we need to do for, for the little kids emotionally, socially. We need to make sure that their, all their needs are, are, are fulfilled in the classroom. And when you have a huge class, it just gets more and more difficult. A um, couple of things. Can I get a copy of your slides? Because you had some data and points in there that I didn't find in the material. So just whatever it's worth, I would love to get a copy of some of the slides. And, okay. And one of them, one of the things on your slide I, I was interested in, Gretchen, you touched on a bit, and I didn't write it down quickly enough. There's something about the group of six or the... Um, big six. The big six. The big six. Can you explain a little bit, because you were using that as an example of how to integrate middle school and high school, and I was, it, it sounded fascinating to me, but then you moved on. Can you explain a bit more about that? Um, it's web-based. I can explain a little bit about it. I'm actually going to be better trained on it in about two weeks from now. Um, the middle school librarian and the high school librarian have spent a great deal of time reviewing this program, which is a, a web-based program that basically divides research skills into six categories. Mm -hmm. And in those six categories, it then has a, a, an enormous um, amount of, of teacher-ready materials at every grade level, K-12, mm -hmm. that basically helps build in a very systematic way, you know, starting, well, what is a source, you know? Then, once you've really got that down, name different types of sources. What makes a good source? How do you talk about two sources at the same time, right? It just, up through the grade levels, builds that. And so, um, that that's what we are, are looking to bring in to help us achieve the research standards that we have and it will um, be something that we can all use and will, uh, will hopefully provide kids with, with some, some common um, language and understandings as they go forward. Well, it sounds fascinating. That's why I wanted to ask a bit about it. It's essentially a, a sub-curriculum that will be sort of run concurrently with, I'm assuming, all uh, subjects. Yeah. Well, it, you, I, it's not like we planned this, but you led me to my third question. Uh, we did plan it. Um, and and I'm, I'm listening to you, and you're trying to weave in uh, literacy skills, uh, critical thinking skills, persuasive writing skills, and you're right. It's hard, That is more one-on-one -on -one than lecturing and data and knowledge. Has there been any thought given, or maybe some thought should be given, to having a critical thinking course, whether it's middle school, high school, and so forth. They taught at colleges. I taught one. And it is a sub um, category of teaching. And rather than breaking up in little bits, which is good, but maybe giving people a basis in whether it's persuasive writing, whether it's uh, critical thinking, logical analysis, logical fallacies, and so forth, teaching it at, at different levels as a one semester course or whatever. Because you're right, it's hard. And then having those skills and using them in your particular course, you don't have to teach the basic skills. They have them, and you can make it more content-based. Just an idea. I think one of the things that, um, you know, as a district we sort of pride ourselves on is valuing the importance of teaching critical thinking in all of our disciplines. Um, and that being said, I also know that um, there are perhaps some, some tools that we can give kids that we haven't. Um, you know, in, in statistics, kids study, you know, fallacies, fallacious thinking, different types of fallacies. They look at um, media, um, 
you know, different sort of media plays and media ta tactics in English. Um, you know, teaching of systematic logic. I have sometimes thought if we incorporate that in our social studies teaching early on, maybe ninth grade or tenth grade when kids are developmentally, conceptually ready for it, the idea then of structuring good logical arguments and that sort of thing makes sense. But um, as with everything else, um, that's the wrong question to ask a social studies teacher. Yes, we should have a sociology course. Yes, we should have a psychology <laughs> course. Yes, kids should be required to take economics. Yes, we need to have a Middle Eastern studies course. We need to have an art history course. Um, so I, I guess the best that we have to work with right now is the idea of, of that incredibly important skill, perhaps beginning to think about, about how we can better systematically teach it in our curriculum. Well, just to follow up, I, I'm not asking, you know, give me a laundry list and ask you to pick one because you can pick right. all of the above, and so would I. Um, I. I was just thinking in terms of you described, you're trying to integrate it, which I think is great. I think it's essential to learning to think critically. Um, but it, it, as an adjunct or as a basis, whatever you want to call it, if you're taking up so much of your time teaching one-on-one, -on -one, which I think you have to, it's, it's just a thought of maybe breaking that off and then doing it at a low enough grade that then they can then carry all the way through high school, all the way through middle school, whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a way of lessening teacher load and maybe increasing cost of the district a bit, but it's, it's a good cost. Just yeah, a thought. I, I, I mean, I, I, I would be interested to see logistically I was taking a breath. Is that what no, I, 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 you? I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> we were using that opportunity. <laughs> <And> <laughs> made sense. Before we wrap, and this this yes. may end in nothing, but I um I, I realized that I was nervous coming here tonight, n not because I was speaking in front of you, but because I'm speaking on behalf of my colleagues who I have so much incredible respect mm -hmm. for, and I, I there's a piece of me that feels that I have not done justice to their perspectives and their values in the curriculum, and I would just like to ask our colleagues in the audience if there is anything that we have not said that we should have or that we said wrong would you please correct us live on film now <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you Gretchen that's perfect thank you thank you yeah and that was the right answer back there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and please always email it to us because we'd love um, you can, you can, are we yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Good job. Have a good night. Good night.